Hey, it's Tony and Jenny Bruski from Real Ghost Stories Online. You know, we love doing this show for you every single week, but doing the show is not free. So if you enjoy the show, we ask maybe you uh, consider helping us out a bit and supporting it. You can do that by becoming an EPP at realghoststoriesonline.com. EPP means extra podcast person. You get an extra podcast for your support of the show. Every single week, we send you a brand new one. And you get access to our past archive of EPP episodes as well. Right now, that's more than 15 bonus episodes along with the weekly episode that you'll be getting every single week for only five bucks a month. If you like the show, help keep us on the air. And become an EPP at realghoststoriesonline.com today. And thank you. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. On today's show, some great stories including strange noises that are heard on the anniversary of a civil war battle in one Virginia home. Could this be the sound of soldiers still in the heat of battle? A multitude of horrifying occurrences terrify four sisters. Parents try everything to rid a toddler of a seemingly possessed toy frog. And an ancient castle in England gives a tour group much more than they bargained for. Those stories, your calls, and more today on Real Ghost Stories Online. Tony and Jenny Bruski joining you once again. Good evening. Good evening. Here's an enunciation question for you. Okay. And this is one that I've been corrected on uh, before, and then I've heard it said completely the other way that I had been saying it forever. Um, E-N-G-L-A-N-D. How do you say it? E-N-G-L-A-N-D. How, how do you say it? England. England? Uh-huh. I always used to say it's England, like with an E, because it's spelled with an E. So I, the way I always enunciated it was, was it was with a sharp E, was England. And then I was corrected a while back of it's supposed to be said more of a England, like I-N almost, uh-huh. in England. Uh-huh. Is that correct? What is the actual... It'd be good to hear from someone from that area, because I don't know the exact real way to say it. Uh, and I've been corrected by professionals here and there. I used to do the entertainment show that used to air over in uh, the UK and such. Uh huh. I did the voiceover on it, and there was, of course, a lot of the stories that we covered were about uh, uh, the Brits and the royal family and things of that nature. So there'd be a lot of England being used, and I would. They're, they're, they're the ones who corrected me and said, "No, it's England." But it was produced in California, so <laughs> I don't know. And then I've heard other people say, who are in the broadcast industry, say, no, England. I don't know. I don't know what the right way is. I don't know. I'd like to have them weigh in on it. I've always uh, said it England, like yeah. I-N-G-L-A-N-D. And I always said it N, like England. Yeah. Our UK friends, please weigh in. Let us know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> because, I mean, it maybe it's one of those things where it's, it's really, there's no true correct way. It's just kind of where you're from. Yeah. <clears throat> the way that it's said. But of course... Uh, C-A-N-A-D-A is always Canadia. That's how that's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I love Canadians. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. If you like the show, be sure to tell a friend about it. Share that link on Facebook or Twitter. Let uh, them know that we exist. Don't be ashamed to love the show. Just uh, just tell, tell the world. That helps us uh, grow the show and helps end up getting you uh, better stories every time we do the show here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's uh, kick off the show here. Let's go out to a letter that was read into us. Lucinda uh, writes in, uh, since this is a, a slow time for you guys, I have a ponderous haunting story for you. I graduated from Madison College, now a university in, Harrisburg, or in Harrisonburg, Virginia, in the 70s. My roommate was a local from New Hope, a tiny spot on the map about 20 miles away. Through chatting, we found out that somewhere in the past, we may have shared an ancestor. Both families were descended from the, uh, from this 
Hessian soldiers? I think it's Hessian. Is Does that mean, is that like a last name? Is that a, a type of soldier? What does that mean? I think it's a soldier from a certain area. Okay. Okay. So like geographic is what that yes. is for a reference. Okay. Uh, and most Hessian soldiers come from the region, oh, here we go, come from the region of Germany called Hess. I'm assuming the E is silent at the end of H-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. Or is it Hesse? I've known people uh. with that last name that pronounced it both ways, so I'm not sure. Okay. Or with it being German, it's like Hesse. I have no idea. <laughs> that's not really German. That's more like Russian when that happens, isn't it? I took German for like three years. I should know the answer to that question, and I don't. It's because I didn't pay attention and failed you're, it. You're just defending all of Europe all in one show, so I'm, I'm just going to leave that to you. There we go. <laughs> I, uh, I'm i not trying to offend Europe. I'm okay. just, I, I'd like to learn how to pronounce, it, to pronounce these names. Uh -huh. I just never paid attention. You know, German is a one class I... Uh, well, I got a D in it. She was nice. I probably should have gotten an F. Really? Yeah. Uh, it was, and I, I dropped it because it was, I was not doing good in it. Everything else was pretty much like B's and A's, but German I was never good at. Huh. I, I honestly, I don't want to like blame someone else for it, but it really was not that great of a teacher. <laughs> so. I have no idea how difficult of a language. It's difficult. Really? Yeah. There's a lot of, yeah. At least I found it very difficult. I took French and I don't know how it weighs in as far as difficulty level in languages to learn. See, I heard, I didn't take French because I heard French was more difficult than German. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the people say the English language is one of the most difficult to learn if it's not your native. Yeah. Because there's a lot that doesn't make any sense. Right. But I find almost all languages that kind of have aspects that don't make a whole hell of a lot of sense. Sure. It's just how it is. Anyhow, continuing on, my mother's Hessian ancestor was from Ohio. Hessian soldiers were used by the British during the Revolutionary War. We shared an interest in ghosts and also uh, possessed a fair amount of ESP abilities between us and called each other cousin. Our dorm building was built over the spot of a farmhouse where a man had hung himself. I did not know this fact until later when strange things began to happen which seemed localized to our room. None of the other rooms or roommates experienced anything unusual. Our room would become suddenly cold, and my roommate reported on one occasion that a stuffed animal I had on my bed arose into the air. My roommate's mother, a native of the area, told us later about the old house and the man who hung himself. Madison College is located in the Shenandoah Valley, which was the scene of fierce fighting during the war between the states. My roommate's family lived in a farmhouse built before the war. It was a small farm located off a country main road. Other farmhouses were also located up and down the main road. Originally, this land was Indian land. When I visited her family, they would talk about the legends and hauntings of the Indians in the area. One home along the road would have periodic hauntings and Indians running up the stairs to the second floor. On my first visit to my roommate's farmhouse, I was given a tour of the new part and the old part of the house. The new part was full of light and was normal in every way. The tour then continued to the old part of the house. The stairs to the second floor bedroom were wooden and the floors were constructed of large wooden planks, which is common in old buildings. The stairway was narrow and did not go straight down the entryway. Instead, it winded or turned halfway. I did not feel particularly cheery in this section of the house as we entered the small front bedroom. My roommate's mother pointed to the ceiling. Embedded in the ceiling was a hook. She pointed out that during the Battle of New Hope, Virginia, not to be confused with New Hope, Georgia, a Union captain was mortally wounded on the battlefield, which was going on just outside the house in the surrounding fields. The hook was used to elevate his leg to stop the bleeding. As he was dying, soldiers had run up and down the stairs with updates about the battle going on outside. He died of his wound, he bled to death, and the blood soaked into the mattress and wood floor. Later, after the battle, his body was removed from the small room. However, the body shifted on the way down the stairway and was dropped, making a loud thud sound. As the anniversary week of the battle approaches, each house along the road reports ghostly happenings, noises or sightings of the approaching ghost army that fought at New Hope. On the very day of the battle, the sound of Booted footsteps can be heard running up and down the narrow stairway of my roommate's home, followed by the sound of a heavy thud. 
The family retained some of the officer's relics, a comb still stained with the man's hair grease and a few other items. I do not remember the officer's name as time has passed. As the tour continued down the, to the family parlor, my roommate's mother opened the door to this room. It was a room unchanged from the war era. A large portrait hung over the fireplace and oriental rugs covered the floor. Old period furniture, which looked unmoved for a long time, was lovingly preserved in the room. She asked me if I wanted to go inside and explore. As I took one step inside, I quickly changed my mind as I felt if I had been restrained by jello. I definitely felt something did not want me inside. Maybe it knew I was a northerner. I politely declined entering the room. The mother had an odd smile on her face, as if confirming something. I later was told that during the war between the states, the family had uh, perpetrated a hoax which ultimately saved the farm. The Union Army burned its way through the South. Crops were burned, and seed for the next crop was destroyed. Warned that this could happen to their farm, all of the seed was brought into the parlor. The Union Army was then told that the, a family member was sick in the parlor with a contagious disease. The Union soldiers did not enter the room, but stood guard on the family. For many days and nights, the family brought food inside the room, and of course, the byproduct of food taken outside. After the Battle of New Hope and the Union Army was gone, the family had its seed for next year's crop. What haunted the parlor may have been the residual fear of being caught with seed by the Union Army, a crime punishable by death, or it could be something more sinister. My roommate's mother then went on to tell of a time when my roommate was just a baby. As a new mother, she was about to feed her baby in the parlor when suddenly the baby looked up and beyond the mother, her face changed from a happy baby to one of horror. The baby began to scream. The mother felt a dark presence behind her. The new mother did not stop to look back. She grabbed and rushed out of the parlor. What scared the baby will never be known. But a house that old, built over the Indian land and having a battle surrounded, could attract a malevolent ghost from, uh, from any era. My roommate's mother may have known who haunted the parlor, but she never did. The Battle of New Hope was just a small battle compared to other battles of the war. Men died on the farmland surrounding my roommate's home. During the day, the farm is serene and beautiful, and I spent several nights with this family in the new section of the house. I never ventured into the old section of the house alone. Wow, with a house with that much history, do you think that the people that originally had the house could be haunting it or just the people from the war itself? I think you could have plenty of people haunting a house. There's room for many ghosts. Mm-hmm. And I, I always wonder about that. Like, if, if you have multiple ghosts from multiple generations, all haunting the same place. The ghosts see each other? I don't know. You know? I could see if it was like two folks who died at the same time in the battle right yeah. there, interacting still. But, you know, you have that as a ghost, and then you have somebody who died in, you know, the 50s or something. Well, could you imagine being a southern family and you have a home and a union soldier dies there and haunts your home and you haunt your home you would have that conflict forever if they a, can see each other a ghostly civil war going on in the home they would never know that the war was over no that's why i wonder of you know the generation seeing each other and all that yeah huh basically if anybody has any 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 stories of the two interacting in some case or form you know, there's got to be a story about that. Or lack thereof, I don't know. Well, we've had some stories about ghosts showing up together, but we don't sure. know if they died together or, yeah. or what the story is as to why they're together. A lot of times, and you're right, there's some where we don't know uh, why they're together, but there are some where we do. And the, But the ones where we do, they do seem to have been from the same period. Uh-huh. You know, the other ones just don't seem to have any real rhyme or reason as to why they're together. I don't know. It's an interesting thought. If anybody has anything they'd like to weigh in on that, our message board is a lovely place to do that and carry on the conversation, which, by the way, is on our website at realghoststoriesonline.com. <clears throat> Phone number again, 
855-853-4802 to call in to Real Ghost Stories Online. Julio writes in, Hey guys, so my experience happened back when I was 14. I was at my parents' house and they just got in a brand new house built in a subdivision a few years earlier. The land used to be uh, an old cornfield, so nothing was out of the ordinary. Anyways, I was sleeping in bed and had the blinds raised about a foot above the bottom of the window. About five or six in the morning, I noticed my cat growling and hissing. So half awake, I threw my pillow at him. Then, when he kept doing it, I got up to do it again. When I saw something staring through the window, I immediately got up and looked out in another room, but it seems to disappear in broad daylight. Now, my window was maybe three feet from the ground, and it seemed like whatever it was was just standing there. It was black, shadowy, with long, shaggy hair, and had almost what looked like tree bark skin. For the longest time, I didn't say anything, as I thought maybe it was a dream. But then, why did my cat jump towards the window and destroy my blinds? I told my family and some friends about it, but only my mom seemed to believe me. I'm 25 years old now. I still don't think people believe me, as I almost don't believe it myself. I still don't know what that was to this day and haven't experienced it since. I wonder if anybody else has had a similar situation happen to them. Thanks for taking the time to read my story. Well, we've had lots of stories about something on the other side of a window that appears to be looking in. You know, I just think with the cat seeing it and trying to attack it that it wasn't just Julio seeing that yeah when the animals are getting involved mm -hmm. it's usually an entity that is not just making itself known to a sensitive and if an animal's attacking it I think it's probably something more on the malevolent side just because yeah. animals are such a good judge of character they're kind of viewing it as a threat right no, it's not like oh someone else to pet me no, it's like, mm, someone's going to kill me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Thank you for um, for the story and uh, and writing into us on the website at realghoststoriesonline.com. If you want more ghost stories, we uh, put out the thing every single week. It's called our EPP bonus episode. EPP stands for Extra Podcast Person, in case you're wondering. Those folks are supporting the show. They're uh, doing a donation through PayPal every month, five bucks a month, or they're just doing a one-year thing. Uh, and uh, that's what's helping to keep this show alive. That's that's what is funding all of the costs that go into uh, producing this show, hosting the show, the bandwidth for this show, all those fun things that are not free uh, that come into uh, to creating the show. So if you like the show, we ask uh, maybe you throw a little money in the kitty and uh, you keep it uh, going for us. So we'd really appreciate that. And we appreciate our EPPs. You can sign up on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. Click become an EPP and uh, you get your email in there and your uh, emails on the list. Then to get that bonus episode every single week. Now up to their 16 bonus episodes. Next email that goes out on, uh, on Saturday, I have a total of 17 episodes in it. So not bad for binge listening. Not at all. Not at all. So please, uh, please do sign up. Crystal writes in, Hi, Tony and Jenny. Let me start off by saying I absolutely love, love, love your show. Sometimes I don't know what I like more, the ghost stories or listening to the commentary between the two of you. I have a few interesting stories, which I believe are paranormal. But for now, I'll just focus on events that occurred in a house my parents owned. Oh, here we go. Oh, Mocaine. That's not bad. No, it's kind of like Spokane, but it's Mocaine. Mocaine. Okay. In Mocaine, Missouri... I, I was, me, I was going to go, uh, Mokani or something, because I always take the, the path of most resistance when it comes to pronouncing city names. Okay. I try to make them much more complex than they actually should be. I don't yeah. know. It's just how I am. Same with last names. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Uh, about 18 years ago. I uh, believed in this house uh, and it was built in the 1930s. And if I remember correctly, there were only one or two families that lived in it before we bought it. Over the 10-year span that my parents owned the house, there were numerous events, too many to mention in detail, so I'll try to keep it as short as possible and just give a brief mention of some of the more memorable happenings. I should start off by stating that I have three sisters. My oldest sister and I are two years apart. She would have been around 19 at the time we moved in, and I would have been about 17, and then there was a six-year gap between me and the younger set of sisters. 
They would have been about 11 and 7. My older sister and I shared a bedroom in this house, and the younger sister shared a bedroom as well. Our bedrooms were connected via a doorway. They literally had to walk through our room to go to theirs. The first occurrence was late one night, just after we moved in. My older sister and I were up late in our room, just sitting around and talking. We heard what sounded like the legs of furniture being pushed across the cement floor of a basement below us. However, we knew there was no furniture in the basement. Since the basement was dug out by hand by whoever built the house, there was no way to get into the room from the basement. You had to go outside and around back of the house to enter the basement. It was inconvenient and creepy, so we didn't even store anything down there. Eventually, we would notice that uh, if an angel figurine that we had on the shelf would turn around a full 180 degrees during the night when we slept. We'd check it before we went to bed and wake up the next morning. It would be turned facing the wall in the direction of our younger sister's room. No other figurines on the shelf ever moved. This happened numerous times, and we never could figure out how or why it happened. The radio in our younger sister's room was notorious for turning on and off, up and down. It would be easy to blame an electrical problem, except for the fact that it seemed to do this in response to things we would say. One night, my little sister and her friend were having a sleepover. They had the radio up too loud for my liking, and I asked them to turn it down. It turned down immediately, and before I could even thank them, they came running out of the room, terrified and screaming. They said they hadn't touched it or turned it down, down on its own, it, or that it did turn down on its own. There were multiple times we would go into that room and sit on the bed and just wait for it, making remarks as to whether or not it would happen. And sure enough, it would turn on and we would take off running. It was almost like a thrill-seeking game for us to see if it would turn on or not, and we were rarely disappointed. We returned home on one occasion after the entire family had been gone on a holiday event and found our dog locked in that bedroom. That room had one of those little cheap bolt locks, the kind you lift up and slide over to latch. It was locked from the inside. She was inside just crying and whimpering, waiting for someone to let her out. I think the most chilling thing that happened was after my younger sisters got home from school. I'd been doing laundry and asked them to put theirs away. They went to their room and came back out arguing because their room was a mess. I went in to find drawers open and clothes thrown all over the room. Neither one would take the blame for creating the mess. They blamed each other. I told them it didn't matter who did it. They were both going to clean it up. So I watched as they picked up the mess of clothes, put them in the dresser, and closed the drawers. Then I followed them out of the room and asked them to take the trash out while I finished laundry. They were both outside and I went to take the last pile of their laundry to their room. When I opened the door, there in the middle of the floor was a nice little stack of clothes they had just put away. The dresser drawer was open once again. I was so freaked out, I just threw the clothes I had in my hands on the floor and closed the door. Those poor kids got to the point they wouldn't even sleep in that bedroom. They slept on the couch in the living room. The bathroom had issues of its own. Late at night, you could be in the kitchen or living room and literally hear the water faucets turn on and start running full blast. It was always fun trying to work up the courage to go turn them off. I was once in the bathroom by myself doing what teenage girls do, staring in the mirror, fixing makeup whenever or whatever, when I felt what I thought was someone's hand pressed down firmly on my left shoulder blade. Turned around to see who it was, but no one was in there. On a separate occasion, I got up around 5.30 a.m. one morning to use the bathroom and found my youngest sister sitting in a tub of cold water. I asked her what she was doing, and she said she was taking a bath late, after everyone had already gone to bed, and during the bath she saw what looked like a woman's leg step out of the towel clo closet next to the tub. She was so terrified she pulled the shower curtain closed, sat there, too scared to move or even run the water to warm it up. She literally sat in that cold tub for hours before I found her. Over the years, we just got used to strange things happening. It was always very random, not like a constant daily thing. Just when you'd think nothing had happened in a while, suddenly something else would happen. 
I think the funniest thing that happened was when we were all sitting in the living room one night talking about all the creepy things that we experienced and comparing our stories. My elder sister's fiancé was there, and he didn't believe any of it. He told us it was all our imagination. He was sitting in a recliner next to his chair. There on the floor, there was a boombox, which was not being used. Literally, as soon as he voiced his doubt about believing our stories, the cassette in the boombox began to play. His eyes turned as big as saucers. I'll never forget the look on his face. It was priceless, and we still laugh about it to this day. There are many other events that occurred in that house and around the area. I'll save those for another time, though. Thank you for your time and for providing such a great show. Krista. There were so many things that happened to those girls. I don't even know where to begin. No. I think the thing that freaks me out the most is the thought of the little girl sitting in the bathtub for so long because she was scared to get out. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know what... Yeah, we're going to begin on yeah, that? Yeah, I don't. Just so much happened. There were some things at the beginning were like, well, that could technically be explained by maybe this or that with electricity, but then like more happened and more happens. Like, no, it's not electricity. It's a ghost. Yeah. I would just completely take all logical explanation and throw it out the window on this one just mm -hmm. because so much happened. Yeah. Wow. Great story. Thank you for writing in. 855-853-4802 is our phone number. If you've not already, press that subscribe button on uh, YouTube or on iTunes or on Stitcher or whatever it is you listen to us on. Please do so. You don't have to search for the show every time. When you want a new episode, they just come right to you into your feed because you press subscribe. And uh, by the way, pressing subscribe helps support our show you know, to let other folks uh, know about it. You, it's not like it's like going to go out to your you know Facebook feed or something, and it, it'll just uh, rhythmically within those systems. The more subscribers shows have, the more it suggests our show to other folks. So that's how it uh, it helps us out quite a bit. So please do press subscribe. It does a lot of good for our show and for you. And you get the show whenever you uh, you want it. Eight five five eight five three forty eight or two. Of course, phone number to call into the show uh, anytime you want. Twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Savannah writes in, hi guys, love the show. Heard the story about the haunted Papa Smurf doll and it reminded me of a story that I heard. A boy I used to babysit had a play date with a friend from school. I started talking to the boy's parents and somehow we got on the subject of the paranormal. They told me about the frog. They had just moved into an apartment complex and they noticed that their son, let's call him Jim, started playing with a stuffed frog. He'd carry it around and would talk to it and since he was only three, they saw no harm. He became very attached to the boy and began sleeping with it. After a while, he started throwing fits when it was time for bed. This surprised Jim par Jim's parents because he had never had a hard time sleeping in his bed. His mother took him aside and asked him what was wrong. Jim said that at night, his frog hops around his room and makes a lot of noise, talking to him and keeping him up. Jim's mother still felt that this was just silly three-year-old stuff, so she told him to tell it to stop. The next few nights, Jim went to bed with no problem. However, his protesting soon returned. His mother inquired if it was the frog talking to him again. Jim said yes. But this time it would jump inside him and demons would come out. They stressed to me that he actually said demons, a word that they never use and they don't know where he could have heard it. Finally, they had enough of this frog and took it away and threw it out in the large trash can the apartment complex shares. All went well for three months until they were doing some cleaning and found it in a hall closet. Jim saw it, picked it up, and began playing with it as he had before. Tell me about a story the other night where, like, the toy came back. The Papa Smurf one, the, and she... Oh, she referenced it. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. As before, he began to fight bedtimes, and his mother asked if the frog was up to his old tricks again, and he said yes. Taking the frog, she put it in her closet late that night. Her husband woke up, uh, woke her up because it was croaking. She took the frog and cut it up. She had a little experience with paranormal, so she took a white crystal. I don't know the exact type and stuck it in the frog. 
She left the remains in the kitchen and the next morning was happy to find it was still there. The crystal she had stuck, stuck in the frog was warm and had turned a very dark color. She showed it to her husband and he thought it was amethyst. I said the word. I, I, I'm so bad at saying that word. You said it. I'm not going to try saying it again because I'm going to screw it up. Okay. But I did say it once. Yes. In the first try. Not good at that one. They threw the frog's body and the crystal out of the large trash can before Jim woke up. When Jim did wake up, neither parents said anything about the frog. But Jim said, we won't be seeing my frog anymore. When they tried to ask him what he meant, he just started laughing. They never had any problems with the frog again. So do you think the frog was possessed with something? Or do you think it was something else that was just using the frog as a a way to get itself in? Well, I think something was using the frog to get itself in, but I also think it may have been attached to the frog. Okay. Where they threw it away. They didn't necessarily, you know, they didn't like burn it. Yeah. So it wasn't like incinerated or, you know, completely destroyed damaged and thrown away so I'm gonna guess that whatever was attached to it for whatever reason didn't have the option of leaving it okay if nothing ever happened again okay that's my thoughts on it I'm just surprised that sticking the crystal in there seemed to take care of it I don't know much about crystals or the, or the use of them but that seemed to do the trick. I know little to nothing about the use of crystals. I know that it is used in this area by some folks. Someone would like to enlighten us on the world of that. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I don't even know enough to be even begin speaking on it or giving an opinion because I would probably sound stupid to be, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like trying to, uh, to, to talk about the plot line of several animated films that I've never seen. Okay. You know, other than I saw the box cover, <laughs> you know, like, yes, and uh, that uh, princess there is named uh, uh, Tiffany, and, uh, you know, and it's like <laughs> nothing like that, you know. Sure. There's a snowman there named Ralph, uh, you know, but then you see the movie and you get some, that's, that's how I want it. Um, yeah. But anyway, it'd be, be interesting to learn more about it. 855-853-4802. That's the phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Of course, you can always write in your stories to the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. It's not going to take forever to get your story on right now because, uh, well, that busy old season of Halloween has kind of slowed down a little bit. So uh, the backlog has gone down quite a bit. So we would love to get your story in here uh, with very little waiting. <laughs> Call a number. Well, yeah, exactly. It's like, well, uh, your estimated wait time will be. Because I was sending out a lot of those emails uh, mm -hmm. around October. It's like, how long until I get a story? And I wrote in like two weeks ago. It's like, yeah, it'll be about a month or two. You know? Right, right. But uh, we've gotten through uh, all of that. So we're back uh, to a short wait time. So uh, if that's been your hold up on uh, getting a story into us, please uh, please do send it in uh, through the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. Let's go to a caller. Hi. Hi, Tony and Jenny. I was going to call you TJ for short. Um, I bet you're going to get a million doppelganger stories now that you had one on today. Um, I just wanted to say about the gin. There's a lady who has done a lot of paranormal research named Rosemary Guiley. Her last name is spelled G-U-I-L-E-Y. She's got a few different videos about the paranormal and she actually studies some of these things. Um, she spells Jin D-J-I-N and she has a really good explanation of what they are. It's similar to ghosts, but it sounds like it's some other kind of being that can take any form that it likes. And it's true, some are evil and some are good. And um, so I just wanted to just quickly tell you my most recent doppelganger story. I was in the kitchen um, doing something, getting dinner ready or whatever. I was thought I heard the um, garage door opening and my husband's voice and my dog also heard it. So I know I'm not going crazy. And 
I went and opened the door to the garage and it was empty. So I don't know what the heck that was, but that has happened more than once where I thought he was home and he wasn't. Anyway, thanks very much for being a part of our lives. You're really wonderful in spreading um, the news about paranormal things, that it's very normal and seems to happen to a lot of people. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks for uh, calling in and, uh, and sharing your story with us. I've never had that happen to me. Have you ever had that happen to you where you think somebody's home? All the time. Really? All the time. Yes. Nuh-uh. Yes. What do you hear? I think I hear the garage door. Okay. Um, I, yeah. Um, and I, I usually can then attribute it to something else where, or like I'll hear a car door or something and I'll think, oh, maybe I just missed a garage door and it's like the neighbor in there. Cause really their driveway's right there and yeah. I can hear it out my window. Um, but I do have it where I think I've heard the garage door. Okay. Quite frequently. And then I go out. And then sometimes I'll just like open the door for you because I know you're carrying something or a human or something of that <laughs> nature. And it'd be helpful to get the door open without having to fumble with your keys. Uh-huh. So I just walk over there and do it. Um, and obviously you see me when I do it because you're there. Uh, but there's been many times where I'll go over and, you know, I open up the door fully expecting to see you there. Nothing. <laughs> but does it ever go past just hearing the garage door? No, I don't hear voices in the garage. Okay, and you don't hear, like, the door try to open and then... No, I never have that. I never have that. It doesn't ever go that far. It's just, I'm I'm, I'm sure I'm mistaking... You know, it's a mechanical sound. Uh Uh-huh. So, there's a lot of things that make mechanical sounds. There, like I said, there's two neighbors here with garage doors that are pretty close in proximity where I I probably have heard those thinking it was our garage door. Well, and being on a cul-de-sac, their garage doors, they're kind of angled at ours. They are. I mean, we're literally, you know, probably about 15 feet away from the neighbor's garage door as we sit here right now. Right. So uh, we're, you know, we're no further away from their garage door than we are from ours. Yeah. Almost. We're probably the halfway point. So that may just be it. Uh, It could be furnace turning on, air conditioner turning on. I've attributed it to the air conditioner in summer quite a bit. You know, if it's rained and it's rained enough to where I'm not... We've had so much drought lately. Let me just say that, that I rarely hear the sump pump. So when I do hear the sump pump kick on, sure, I oftentimes think it's the garage door. And then I automatically get super paranoid and go flood. And I run down to the basement and sit there and watch it. It'd take a lot for us to have a flood. Because that'll make the water stop. Yeah. Watching it <laughs> and worrying about it. Yeah. Willing it away. Very <laughs> productive courses of action there. <laughs> Well, I always think, you know, if, if he starts getting high and it can't keep up, I can start bailing it out or something. Oh, my God. Have you ever had to do that? Yes. Oh. I Remember that little red house we lived in? I do. That flooded. I do. Yes, the, I've had to do that. The house I grew up in, we would get these horrific storms and we backed up to a lake. And for whatever reason, the drainage wasn't right. And so the rainwater would like flow back in right where the sump pump was. Yeah. There was many times, many times in the middle of the night, all four of us would be down there with these big old coffee cans bailing out the sump hole and yeah. chucking it out the back door. Oh, I hated that yeah. so much. I hate the nightmares that go along with it. Yeah. See, I would love to live on a lake again or a house that huh? backs up to a lake, but I don't want to deal with that anymore. I, yeah, I feel the exact same way. I, it, just for our listeners, we, uh, uh, the house that, uh, that we lived in previously, um, it was one that I had, had bought before I'd ever met you. And, uh, it, uh, it was on a little lake, little, little Kansas Lake which is basically a small pond uh, and also sometimes used as like uh, all catch all water catch that I don't know what the t- correct term would for it is I know there is a runoff. term yes yeah, a runoff pond if you will and in most cases when you're not experiencing eight inches of rain in the course of an hour they function just fine but uh, when you have that much rain in the course of about an hour which we did um, it uh, it tends to back up yeah. and uh, back up right to your windows. And if they're view out in the basement, uh, I literally, I was in this house for about, God, 
uh, not long. <laughs> like three weeks or three, something. Yeah, three, four weeks. And I uh, I had to run home uh, because someone called the radio station and said, uh, there's water up to your windows. So I run down, I get to the house, and quite literally I could see below the water line through the basement window. Thank God the window didn't break. I, it was, it went any higher, it would have happened. Uh, uh, but um, it uh, did seep through the walls and everything. Some pump did back up. It couldn't keep up with the water. And that's what ended up flooding my basement. Uh, but they never really quite fixed all of the problems in that area. And uh, I sat there every time it rained. Uh, and we had a wet year or two there where it just rained a lot. We did. And, and we went straight into <laughs> it went drought. To drought. Right after we left, it went to drought. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, yeah. And uh, just the anxiety that that caused sitting there, not knowing what's going to happen was horrible that was that, that was worse than ghosts well i remember we were dating and you didn't leave your house for like 24 hours you didn't go to work because you were terrified it was going to flood again because we were supposed to get quite a bit of rain yeah i remember bringing bringing you food because you just were like i had like a floodlight that i was yeah. i was monitoring the water because it was going up past the normal part of the lake it was starting to inch its way into the yard like the blob uh-huh <laughs> and it's like it's getting closer it's getting closer i'm like i'm hoping it stops and eventually it did stop but so you get that much rain your sump pump can start backing up but yeah i hated that hated it so glad that we're not there anymore but it was a really it was a cute house other than that shit it was a nice little house i it mean it was it was cozy we got married there yeah it was a, it was a nice place and then that so anyway, good times back to ghost stories back to ghost stories James writes in, Hi, Jenny. Hi, Tony. A friend of mine introduced me to the show a few weeks ago, and now I listen to the podcast daily, helping me get through a long day at work. Well, thank your friend for uh, for telling uh, you about the show. Really do appreciate that. With uh, listening to everyone else's stories, I thought I would uh, share one of mine with you. For a little background, I live uh, in a city called Newcastle upon Tyne in England, uh, and we have many old castles and other such structures in or around the city, which have many ghost sightings over the years. During one cold November day, my girlfriend at the time and I booked up a ghost uh, hunt to the Castle Keep. This is a small medieval fortification, and the location even dates back to being part of the old Roman fort. This being our first ghost hunt, I was rather anxious at the time, and uh, but entering... Uh, the main chamber of the keep, not knowing what I was going to expect, but became began to relax as we were separated into our team for the night. While walking around the castle, nothing appeared to be out of the uh, normal until we reached the chapel. When first stepping into the room, the atmosphere felt different. The air felt heavier, and there was a feeling that we were being watched while in the small room. We gathered in a circle and being asked questions or to see if we could get a response from any spirits that we would hear or if they were near. If anyone is there, can you please make a noise? We asked, but we got no response. As we continued to ask questions, the room felt as if it was getting darker and the air heavier. I'm not sure if this was my imagination or power of suggestion due to the situation we were in, but that was just the start. Trying a new approach, we placed a table in the middle of the room and began table tipping as everyone placed their hands lightly on top of the table and uh, one of us asking out, if anyone is there, can you please use your energy and ours to move the table? No more than a few seconds later, the table began to creak and move across the stone floor. As the energy built, the table then began rocking from side to side and kept leaning towards me and my girlfriend. No matter where we move on to the on the table, it would always move towards Becky and hang in place on two legs. With me being a bit of a skeptic at the time, I asked if I could push the table ta uh, down onto four legs to make sure nothing was holding it up. And everyone kept their hands on top of the table. I moved mine towards the end of it and began to push it to the floor. As I applied pressure, it was as if a force beneath the table was keeping it up on two legs as if someone was pushing against me grabbing my flashlight i shined a light underneath the table to check and no one was holding it in place as i suspected everyone's hands were on top of the table and nothing was holding it up on two legs 
The group was certain at this point that we were not alone in the room and wanted to continue the investigation further. To see if we could experience anything else, a guide told us of the priest who used to work in the chapel, how he renounced God during his life, and that he would bully those who worship the Lord. Deciding to see if we could get a reaction, we knelt at the altar and began to say the Lord's Prayer. We start off, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The room began to feel as if it got darker again, and those behind us swore they saw a shadow standing behind one of us kneeling by his altar. As we almost finished up the prayer, the woman to the right began to gasp for air and starts crying. Immediately, we stand up and rush over to her, making sure she's okay. After calming her down and asking her what happened, she explained that as she was praying, she felt someone hold onto the back of her head and begin to push her head down towards the floor as if to make her bow towards the altar. At this point, the woman pushed to the floor and her friend leave back from the main chamber. However, those of us left gathered around a Ouija board that we were provided with. The guide opened up the circle and we asked how many spirits were in the room with us. The glass slid around the number of unsure and placed itself on one. We asked again, however, this time we had a different number, five. Is there only one spirit with you? No. Is there five? Yes. Did someone tell you to lie? Yes. Was it the same person who upset our friend before? Yes. Looking at each other, the group worried a little and then asked the spirit, Do you belong to the castle? No. The glass then moves towards Becky and stays there, resetting the glass and not asking any questions. The glass would always move towards Becky. Are you attached to Becky in some way? Yes. Can you tell us your name, spirit? The glass began to move around the table and started to spell out the name A-L-B-E-R-T. Becky took her hand from the glass and looked panicked. I asked, what's wrong? She then replied, that was my grandfather's name. At the time, I didn't know what her grandfather was called, nor did anyone else in the group, as we don't know each other. Albert, is anyone else with you, if you can tell us their name? The glass moved again, this time spelling out W-H-I-S-K-Y. This was the name of her grandfather's dog. We have a few more things happen that night. However, nothing as major as this, I feel. I'm due to go on another ghost hunt early next year and would love to share this with you guys. Apologies for being a long letter. Love your show and keep up the good work. James in Newcastle upon time in England. So... This is the second story that we've had from somebody in that area. Yeah. And so I Googled it because I can Google that. And it looks like not only is it a very old city, but it's also a pretty modern looking. I mean, obviously they're modern as in they've got all the normal conveniences of today, but they look like they're pretty futuristic almost. Really? Like they've got some really unique looking bridges and stuff. But I couldn't find the castle he was talking about. I really wanted a picture of the castle. So I hope that if somebody knows where I can find a picture of that, I would just love to be able to see that, you know? Maybe they can send one in. I wonder if they took any pictures. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. And yes, we would love to hear more of your ghost hunting stories as you go on more uh, adventures. If anything happens to you, certainly do uh, let us know about it. We'd, uh, we'd absolutely love that. Uh, Daniel writes in, Hello, Tony and Jenny. My husband and I found your podcast around a month ago, and we absolutely love to listen uh, every day at work and at home. I have a couple stories for you, but we'll start with a childhood story. When I was around six or eight years old, I was in my bedroom with nothing but a TV on. I heard a noise, and I looked up at my shelf above the foot of my bed, and there was my teddy bear levitating and spinning in place. I couldn't say anything at first. I tried, but nothing came out. I sat in my room for a good 10 minutes and didn't say anything or call for my mom. Finally, when I did get the call to call for my mom, she came into my room and turned white as a ghost, no pun intended, and stared at the teddy bear as if she didn't believe me. 
So the next weekend, I went to my dad's. When I came home, I overheard my mom telling my aunt on the phone that I needed to get out of the house because she needed to have it blessed and cleansed. I never realized what she was talking about until I was a little older and she told me the rest of the story. She added that when they blessed the house, whatever was in there slid glasses of water off the middle of the coffee table and threw the teddy bear around the house multiple times. They would go into the room, it would fly into another room or into the hallway. Now when I say fly, I assume she meant like someone threw it, not like it had wings sauntering in the summer breeze. She also found out the day after the blessing or cleansing that my uncle and his girlfriend were using a Ouija board in my room the weekend before, when they house sat. I want to end my story by saying that well, that was some freaky shit. We love the show, and uh, we're going to become EPP soon. Thank you for providing uh, us with your time. We love to listen to you. Your cat missed out when she didn't pay attention to your radio shows in the basement back in the day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, she was just too busy being a bitch, you know. Oh, that's just horrible. <laughs> Jeez. Murphy was a mean cat. Well, she just didn't like a terroristic little boy. Yeah, she probably didn't appreciate being flung at the ceiling and things of that nature when I was really little. Yeah, I think you're a little too... I think there was a reason... Scary for her. She wasn't a fan of me. Yeah. I just wanted to cuddle with my kitty. I found a meow meow. Yeah. <laughs> I probably did a lot of the things that Harper does with uh, with our cat. You know, she, I mean, I got a little bit older and just kind of was vindictively mean to the cat. But um, the, you know, Harper just wants to love the cat and doesn't understand that you can't like hold it upside down and hug it like a stuffed animal. You know. <laughs> For anybody that's ever seen Animaniacs, Elmira is our daughter. <laughs> and uh, that's all I have to say about that's that. That's exactly how she is with our cat. She chases it and loves it. And amazingly, this cat is, she's like a rag doll. She, she's not fighting back. She like kind of like gets it. She's like, okay, the kid doesn't mean harm. The only thing the cat doesn't like is that you constantly call it a her when it's yeah, a him. Yeah, that's true. The cat has some identity issues. No, I've, I've, you have issues. <laughs> the cat's normal. It's not the cat's fault. I've always had female cats. So this is the first male cat I've ever had. So it's something with me where I'm just so used to calling the pets she's. Because I've only had female pets, too, just in general. They've always been female pets. So to suddenly have one that's a male, I'm, I'm just so not used to referring to the pets in that term. I don't know. He is a good little kitty. He is a great little kitty. And he puts up with a lot of crap. He does. <laughs> Jim writes in, hey guys, I love the show. I've uh, seen at least two apparitions in my life, but I'll tell you the first one for now. I lived in Puerto Rico at the time. I was walking home from a friend's house and on the way past another friend's house and saw his little sister, China, standing at her front door. China's cute, pale skin, blonde hair, blue eyed, little girl, about the age of seven or eight at the time. Anyway, I asked for her brother. Where's David? She stood there making eye contact with me, but she did not say a word. So I asked her again, China, where's your brother? She just stayed there with a cold look on her face. So I started to walk to the front door and she ran inside, leaving the door half opened. I opened the door to see my friend's mom cooking. So I asked her for David. She told me that he's helping someone out with a job. So I said, okay, but uh, before I left, I asked what's wrong with China? She upset? She said, China? China's in school. Well, looking at me weird, I said, oh, okay. Walked home, scratching my head. The next day I saw her, but she was normal and talked and played as always, so I just left it alone and never told anyone. I don't know if maybe it was just the heat that day that made me see her, but I did not see her even though she was at school. Or I did see her even though she was at school. What do you guys think? I still think about this from time to time. Can't wait to hear what you guys think. Maybe I'm just crazy. Love you guys. Hope all is well. Jim. I think it was a doppelganger. I do too. I don't, China's alive. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think that it was just a little seven or eight year old that skipped school that day and was hiding from her mother. I mm -hmm. think it was probably something else. Yeah. I think you saw a doppelganger. As far as why you saw it, I have no idea, but 
Yeah. That's what I think it was. Tony writes in. Hi, Jenny and Tony. Thank you for reading my man in the blue suit story. I had another unexplained occurrence in the same building. I never thought about the two incidents being connected until I listened to Tony read my story on the air. For a short while, I attempted to work at Victorian Square during the evenings. As I explained before, my art studio was on the fourth floor of the building. I was able to lock off the elevator and the stairwell. I was assured of being the only person on the fourth floor. The security guard would come up every couple of hours to check on me. But other than that, I was completely alone. As I would settle into my work, I would begin to hear multiple doors open and close along with the sound of shoes walking across a hard surface floor. The paces of the footsteps are fast, not running, but with a purpose. It sounded like a busy office with people moving about steadily and intentionally. One set of footsteps sounded like a woman with high heel shoes. I would leave my studio area and walk out into the main gallery area only to find that I was alone. There was no one else on the fourth floor. It's important to note that the fourth floor is the top floor of the building, so I was not hearing footsteps from the floor above me. I would hear sounds from the roof and the heating cooling system, but they were distinct and definitely not the sounds that I was hearing. I eventually learned to shut the door of my studio and turn my music up loud to drown out the office sounds. Needless to say, I did not work nights for very long. Thinking about it now, it seems as if the incidents are related and that it was spirits reliving their everyday work lives. I feel sorry for them. If I am able to, uh, if, I'm, uh, if I am to relive or relieve my life over and over, I want to relive moments of exceptional joy, not the boring everyday stuff. I always thought residual hauntings were moments of high emotion left in the atmosphere. Therefore, I no longer think that it might be residual. I believe they're just spirits that are tied to their everyday work. Kind of sad, really. I do not have any other incidents in that particular building, but I do have other stories to share at a later date. Take care. Keep up the great broadcast, Tony. <clears throat> you know, she brings up a great point about if you're going to relive parts of your life mm -hmm. over and over as a ghost you want to live the extraordinary ones sure you said it almost makes you think of the whole seize the day you know make the most out of every day because you never know if you're gonna get stuck in one of the shitty ones over and over and over absolutely <laughs> it's a very good point <laughs> it is it really is i never really thought of it that way me neither that's really interesting. Thanks for writing in and sharing your story. We would love to hear uh, more stories from you. And if you want more ghost stories, you can become an EPP. We really appreciate that. It keeps our show alive. And as a thank you, we give you a bonus episode every single week. Sign up on the website at realghoststoriesonline.com. Click become an EPP. And here's a thought, too. If you're looking for a unique holiday gift, Christmas gift for someone, uh, or uh, whatever it is you're celebrating, you can uh, give the gift of ghosts. And uh, you can sign up a friend to be an EPP. Huh? Check that out. And uh, we will then uh, get them signed up and you can uh, print out a little something, something, say, hey, here's what I got you for Christmas. Be a nice little gift. Throw in a ghost in the jar. Yeah. And for a limited time, you'll get a ghost in the jar. No, really, you won't. But you get bonus episodes and a lot of them. So there, there you, you go. go. Check it out. RealGhostStoriesOnline.com. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to Real Ghost Stories Online. <laughs>